Micah Xavier Johnson served in the U.S. Army and he did a tour in Afghanistan. His family and his neighbors described him as Army Strong. He was a well-respected veteran who loved to play basketball until now. Micah is believed to have been the Dallas shooter, the sniper that killed five police officers and wounded seven others. The attack took place as a Black Lives Matter protest were marching over the shooting deaths of two black men by police earlier in the week. Yet this manufactured civil unrest is not only playing into the agenda of gun control advocates and the technocrats who long for more police state and surveillance measures, it is playing into a larger agenda that includes the breakdown of civil society. You can't enslave the population through force. They have to be afraid and feel that all extreme measures are necessary for their own safety. Hence the violent element of the Black Lives Matter movement, where veterans like Micah Johnson are conditioned into committing violent acts. Civil unrest is what drives and justifies political action, from the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, where police would protect the protesters who chanted for more cop killings, to the manufactured Arab Springs, or even the agent provocateurs in Montebello, Quebec. Civil unrest can be used to clamp down on protesters or ignite extremist elements and provoke violence. At the upcoming Republican National Convention, the pro-Trump crowd is being allocated to the same protest zone as the Black Lives Matter protest. This is a problem waiting to happen. The RNC protests are being designed to generate chaos. They are attempting to kick the race war into overdrive. But just who are Black Lives Matter? While a majority of the sympathizers may be legitimately concerned with the amount of white cops killing black people, especially young people, the core of this group is militant, and as is in the case of Micah Johnson, connected to the U.S. military. In Canada, the biggest faction is located in Toronto. Researcher and journalist Greg Renouf has exposed connections within this group linking the militants to some troublemakers in Occupy Toronto, Idle No More, and many others. The movement also has links to the Coop Labour Union, the Law Union of Toronto, the Student Association of George Brown University, the University of Mississauga Campus Students Union, the University of Toronto Students Union, and many others. These are the neo-Marxists looking to further solidify statism and cultural Marxism into the daily lives of Canadians. They are violent and they will try to smear and undermine anyone who stands in their way. These are the people who feel empowered by such publications as Adbusters with their connections to Tides Canada and George Soros. The Black Lives Matter movement, the shooting in Dallas, isn't about addressing real social concerns. These movements, funded by Soros and other powers that be, are interested in kicking the race war into overdrive, turning Martin Luther King's dream into a nightmare, and diverting attention away from the real problems, the real issues, and the real solutions. The state is a monopoly on violence, and this is the problem that must be addressed. Racist white cops likely wouldn't find work in a free market of legal and security services, especially if the clientele are inner city black families. The truth of this, the truth behind free markets and liberty, are masked by status propaganda making everything an issue of race or sexism, class, colonialism, or some other form of prejudice. 
but there are only two classes in society people who earn their wealth and people who take it the politician and the central banker are no different from the thief and the murderer this isn't a black and white issue it isn't about your skin color this is about the state versus the people it's about the legitimacy of the so-called social contract and whether or not democracy is worth saving well hello again you've all heard about the problems that occurred in Dallas uh, we want to discuss that very briefly even though there are preliminary things that are coming in various facts that and some of them are being contradicted right now as we speak as more uh, verification of what's going on and what happened uh, is released to the public but these sorts of things that you saw uh, last night well this is the day after the incident were commonplace in the 1960s and 70s commonplace to the extent of it was almost every week and we in the John Birch Society had a support your local police program which we still have today which supports the police and also wants them to remain independent of the federal government. In other words, we don't want our local police to be nationalized. Now, that is the end result of a lot of this agitation that's going on right now. Now, we don't know, we don't begin to know the backgrounds of the four individuals that, as of this moment uh, that were involved in these shootings. But we do know that unless the police have the correct mindset, they're not going to ask the correct questions to find out what really motivated these people. And one of the problems that we had in the beginning of our Support Your Local Police program was a vast amount of ignorance that was out there as to who and what was behind all of the street violence and that sort of thing. Let me just show you one little clue. And uh, this is a copy of the Crusader. Now, you can't see this very well, but it is, a, is sort of a knighted, uh, and they called him Afro-American at this point, uh, igniting the cities. In other words, this was a publication designed to get the uh, black community to go out and burn down the cities. Now, it was published in Cuba and imported into the United States. What was going on in the streets behind the Black Panthers and a lot of these other organizations and one called RAM, the Revolutionary Movement, uh, was all run out of the cadre from Cuba. Many of these people went to Cuba for their training and came back in these revolutionary forces and snipers and, uh, and, and burning down the cities and that sort of thing. Now, we have been able to establish, even now, the fact that communists are heavily involved in these street demonstrations and street violence city after city after city across our country today. Jim Fitzgerald and myself, Jim is, is a former policeman in Newark, New Jersey, and myself go out and give talks about this to document the fact that these are coordinated events from the Communist Revolutionary Party and that sort of thing. And, and so if you don't know the right questions to ask these suspects, are you involved in any communist or subversive movements, rather than what motivated you to do this, and they said, well, we're just mad at Whitey, that's insufficient. Uh, you know, and that's the kind of thing that they are trying to purvey amongst the, the viewers of the television uh, programs, even on Fox last night, or the, early this morning, actually, was that this was just uh, in retaliation for something that happened in some other city. Well, why do you go out and kill cops in your city because you're mad at a policeman in another city? That doesn't make sense. There's a lot more going on here, and it's in the reaction on the part of the population. They're trying to get everybody to react, both in the, in the black, Hispanic, and white communities. They're trying to get us to stand still for more police protection in sympathy with, to what happened to these policemen. What happened to them is terrible. But we don't want to nationalize our police in the process because we need more police protection, be that as it may. There are a lot of things on the other side of the equation, too, to stir things up. You had publications like this stirring up the extremists in the white 
communities, trying to get them to go out and punch black people in the face and, and that sort of thing. So you had agitators working both sides of the fence in, in uh, building up racial animosity. And we in the John Birch Society, through our Support Your Local Police Committees and another committee that we had, went into these communities and calmed things down and got them to understand that, look, because you're a white man, you're not my enemy, or because you're a black man, you're not my enemy. My enemy is the people that are trying to stir us up and burn our cities down and get us into race war. That is our enemy and those individuals. And a lot of it is being pervaded uh, on campuses and that sort of thing. This is a communist publication, the Monthly Review. And in here they have an interview with Malcolm X and, and the colonial war at home. In other words, we are involved in anti-colonialism inside the United States, even. It's a communist slogan. And they're trying to whip people up into fighting government and the police and so on and so forth. And in here, in the Malcolm X interview, they advocate that what we really need is a national police force as a step towards a United Nations police force. And this hasn't changed either. Uh, and in a presentation that uh, Mr. Fitzgerald and myself give, we point out the, these various things and how it all comes together. We, we lay out a, a, a series of photographs to show you what's really behind these demonstrations because you only see the local demonstration in your paper. But when you lay out a whole panorama of these demonstrations that happen across the country, we can show you the similarities and how they're all coordinated. But we've got a real problem this time that we didn't have before. And that is that some of these cities today are actually run by communists. And they proudly proclaim this in their People's World newspaper. Cities like Seattle and New York and Richmond, Virginia and others where the top of the, of, uh, the police, the, the mayors and the city council and that sort of thing are controlled by the communists and then you've got the street communists and the police are caught in between. And they aren't allowed to do the things they need to do that they know they have to do to quell the violence before it even gets started. And we get into that in our presentation and document all of this stuff. But we, even in the 60s and 70s, had reports from the federal government which demonstrated that this violence that was in the streets, and these are from the Congress of the United States, they document that this violence and everything else was coming from communist cadres. Uh, they would even pay communists to come onto college campuses to recruit in the classroom. And here is a study that was done on that, that, that they would actually pay these, these communist agitators to come into classes and, and, and list people out of those classes to get into the streets and everything else and pay them to do so with honoraria. So a lot of this was going on then, and we know it is going on today. And so if you're interested in learning more about what is really going on in the streets of America today, I urge that you contact the Public Relations Department of the John Birch Society and see if you can't get one of us to come out and give a full presentation to an audience uh, with visuals as to what is going on, how it is coordinated, the direction they want to take us, and how dangerous it is to American liberty. In the meantime, do not fall for this agitation to where you start blaming blacks or blaming whites or blaming Hispanics. These are very small cadres of people, highly trained, to get people into the streets and whip them up. They are the enemy, not your neighbors, not your fellow employees or anything else, just because they belong to a, a different religion or because their color of their skin is a little different than yours. Don't ever fall for that stuff. Locally controlled police are essential to a free society. Ultimately, there are two types of police. Locally controlled police, who serve the local citizens, and nationally controlled police, who serve the national government. 
Typically, a nationally controlled police never changes into a local police, but historically speaking, locally controlled police have become nationalized. This is something every American should be aware of because signs of nationalization of our local police are all around us. In order for locally controlled police to become nationalized, seven steps generally need to occur. First, a crisis is needed so the public and local police demand help. The attack of 9-11, the Boston bombing, and even the riots in Ferguson and Baltimore are events within the 21st century alone that have been used to promote the need for a national police force. Second, in response to the crisis, aid is accepted in the form of military assistance, federal funding, and grants. For decades, Congress and the executive branch have used certain programs to quietly transfer military equipment into the hands of the local police departments. This is why many are witnessing the more militarized look of police instead of the iconic boys in blue. For instance, since 1994, Congress has provided more than $14 billion in aid to the COPS office, which is a component within the Department of Justice, in an effort to advance community policing. This includes grants awarded to more than 13,000 state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies to fund the hiring and redeployment of more than 126,000 police officers. Third, along with aid comes legislation. Since 9-11, America has allowed the passing of multiple bills in the name of security, such as the Patriot Act, authorizing things like warrantless searches and wiretaps, the Homeland Security Act, authorizing the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. Congress has also passed many bills providing funds to the DHS for assisting local police and firefighters with things like training, additional personnel, and buying emergency equipment. In response to the 2014 Ferguson riots, the Department of Justice initiated a program called the National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. It provides a three-year, $4.75 million grant to fund pilot programs in six cities for federal training of local police. In December of 2014, the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing was established, which imposes federal standards on state and local police. As you can see, the federal government is becoming more transparent in its attempts to nationalize our police. Fourth, propaganda is abundant during riots and demonstrations. History has proven that radical groups use propaganda to exploit and depict local law enforcement as brutal or racist. For decades, this strategy has discredited officers while advancing the campaign against local police. America has witnessed a steady stream of police brutality charges, emanating from the riots of the 60s and 90s all the way to the latest riots in 2015. The latest claims of police brutality were made by the same radical socialist and communist groups as well as by some new George Soros spawned groups. With the use of demonstrations and marches, these groups have attempted to discredit the police with charges of police brutality, then have proceeded to disseminate their message of police brutality throughout a broad range of media outlets. This negative campaign has influenced the public's perception of police. Fifth is indoctrination. For decades, the federal government has been training local police about crises. This federal training has two main goals. Number one, to train local police how to use equipment and tactics from the federal government. One example is the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, which is part of the DHS. They provide a wide array of basic and advanced training to state, local, tribal, international, and federal law enforcement officers all across the country. Some of the police training is so militarized that local officers are trained to think like soldiers. Number two, federal information is used to indoctrinate local police about those labeled as extremists or domestic threats. This has been done through the DHS and its fusion centers. These centers share information from the federal level all the way down to the local level governments. 
An example is a DHS report given to local law enforcement personnel warning that disgruntled military veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan wars could join extremist groups. The report went on to say, right-wing extremism in the United States can be broadly divided into those groups, movements, and adherents that are primarily hate-oriented, and those that are mainly anti-government, rejecting federal authority in favor of state or local authority, or rejecting government authority entirely. It may include groups and individuals that are dedicated to a single issue such as opposition to abortion or immigration. So would you label these individuals as extremists or domestic threat? Sixth, we then see implementation. With gradual implementation of these steps, local police, for all practical purposes, become an arm of a national police force beholden not to the people, but to the national government. Meanwhile, Americans believe the federal government is fixing the problem. For instance, the reaction to the 2014 Ferguson riots was the creation of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. A few months later, the President stated, We have a great opportunity coming out of some uh, great conflict and tragedy uh, to really transform uh, how we think about uh, community law enforcement relations. He also referred to the Task Force's recommendations as, pragmatic, common-sense ideas. When the final report went public, it revealed specific recommendations for federal management of local police. Things such as national policing practices, national benchmarks, federal technical assistance and funding of local police forces, and working with the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that community policing tactics in state local and tribal law enforcement agencies are incorporated into their role in homeland security. So, with little news coverage or public backlash in response to the report, one can see the conditioning of America is becoming very real. Finally, seventh is nationalization. At this point, a true national police force becomes a reality. Local police departments assimilate into a national police force which takes full charge of the responsibilities and duties of previously local and state controlled law enforcement agencies. Now, as you well know, we are not at this stage yet. However, with the initiatives being promoted by the federal government, many should be alarmed. We as citizens need to realize what the executive branch is attempting. It is an obvious move to gain federal control of local police forces. We need to remember, law enforcement should be a local, not a federal function. Regardless of what is happening, in the end, the Constitution does not authorize a president's national standards for police or the taxpayer-funded bribes being used to impose them nationwide. That means what the federal government is doing regarding policing is unconstitutional. Police departments should be responsible to the local communities that fund them and to those they are supposed to serve. If we want to maintain our freedom, we need to support our local police and keep them independent. Get involved in your local area and make sure your state and local governments work for you.